Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsor, BMO Private Bank, for making this lecture possible. And you have at each of your seats um, a season program guide. This, is, this booklet outlines all the programs available throughout the coming season here at the museum. I hope you'll join us for many of those programs. And one program in particular is highlighted with a, a postcard at your seat. This is our holiday evening tour program, which begins on December 18th. So I think we've got about six nights of holiday evening tours available. It's great to see Whitehall after dark. Completely different experience. Uh, this year it marks the 100th anniversary of the end of Flagler's extraordinary life, but his legacy continues. If you haven't had a chance, I hope after this lecture you'll take the time to rush upstairs before four o'clock when we close the second floor to see the temporary exhibit on Flagler's legacy there in the second floor gallery. When Flagler came to Florida, <clears throat> it may well have been the poorest state in the nation. But today, Florida's economy is the third largest among the 50 states, and it's as large as nearly 95, larger than I should say, nearly 95% of the nations of the world. So we've gone from zero to 60 pretty fast in this state, uh, thanks to the foundation created by Henry Flagler. He established the agricultural industry, the tourism industry, and created the transportation infrastructure that made it possible for Florida to develop rather quickly. Today's lecture is focusing on our beloved Christmas uh, carols here in America. And we've asked Ronald Langford, who's a freelance writer and music reviewer living in Appomattox, Virginia, uh, to come talk to us about America's Christmas carols from America's Gilded Age. He's written many books on the cultural history uh, and political history and social science. And we're pleased to have Ronald Langford here to tell us about America's Christmas Carols. Thank you, Ronald. Come on up. Good afternoon. Happy holidays. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. I'm glad to see all of you here this afternoon, and I'm very excited to have the opportunity to lecture at the Flagler Museum. Uh, it's been an opportunity for me to uh, continue my work. I've been researching, writing about uh, Christmas songs and carols for three or four years now. And it has also allowed me a chance to expand my work to an earlier uh, time period. And um, that's been great. I've collected uh, a whole lot of material and I'll be sharing some of that uh, with you this afternoon. I was thinking coming down here, down to Florida, uh, my wife and I, Elizabeth, are from Appomattox, Virginia. And as you might imagine, it's quite a bit colder in Appomattox than it is here. I was thinking about Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye um, near the beginning of White Christmas. They are in Florida, it is the middle of December, and they decide to go to Vermont. Uh, that seemed counterintuitive to me. It still does. I'd like to thank a couple of people. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Allison Goff. Um, Allison uh, got in contact with me back in July, I believe, and we've been in touch by email, by phone, working out the details of the lecture, looking for audio tracks, and I've truly really enjoyed working with her, so thank you, Allison. I'd also like to thank my wife, Elizabeth Lankford, who is here with me today. Elizabeth's always been my uh, first editor, whether I'm writing or speaking. And so she sits there patiently today, even though she's heard this lecture um, several times already. So thank you, Elizabeth. We will be talking today about uh, Christmas carols and Christmas songs, or specifically about American Christmas carols and songs written in the latter half of the 19th century and we'll be learning about the people who wrote their songs, uh, learning more about their lives. I think it's easy to get the impression with any tradition, tradition like Christmas, that you grow up within, that that tradition and the rituals around that tradition have always been with us. Um, I was born in 1962, and when I was six or seven, I became very attached to 
Gene Autry's version of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And like any kid, I played it dozens of times. It was only much later when researching that I discovered that Autry first had a hit with Rudolph in 1949. So my sacred Christmas tradition was only about 20 years old. I think the same thing is true when we look back at the 19th century, um, that we just believe that the traditions we are familiar with were in place at that time. That if we went back, say, to the 1850s, that Americans would have been used to attending church services in which um, a minister spoke about the nativity, in which the choir sung carols. And later on, I think after the Civil War, we would probably guess that most Americans were familiar with songs like Jingle Bells or O Little Town of Bethlehem. In truth, though, Christmas as we know it, Christmas that would be familiar with us, does not really get started until the beginning of the 19th century. It is not even firmly established until after the Civil War. Uh, the oldest song I will talk about today is, um, it came up on a midnight clear, written in 19, I mean, excuse me, 1849. The newest is I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, and the music was not written for that until 1872. And so while these songs are quite a bit older than, um, say, White Christmas or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, from a historian's view, they're really not that much older. Everything in America, everything about Christmas in America would change in the beginning of the 19th century. Middle class got interested in Christmas. Middle class was growing. Um, they were attracted to Christmas traditions, or what they believed Christmas traditions were, and they thought that Christmas could reflect their values, their values of family, their values um, of home, and also their religious faith. Uh, but they would be up against two obstacles um, while trying to establish Christmas. The first obstacle was um, religious. There had been a long tradition in America by many conservative groups, conservative religious groups and denominations, of not celebrating Christmas at all. They did not have um, do any type of services or anything for Christmas. And this, this was also true up through the middle part of the 19th century. And I've got a quote here I'm going to read from um, Albert and Shirley uh, Menendez. As late as 1857, the New York Times reported that Yesterday, Christmas Day, services were held in Catholic, Episcopals, and Lutheran churches, where evergreens and music were plentiful. The churches of the other denominations were closed. And I have another quote here from um, Consumer Rights, a book by Timothy Smith, in which he writes, in the half century after 1820, many of the strenuous Protestants made the requisite adjustments in their ritual life to include the holidays and to embrace the new Christmas bazaar, the growing alignment of evangelical Protestants behind the modern Christmas was integral to the holiday's cultural ascent. Though still alarmed by the ungoverned festivities of the streets, American Protestants seemed increasingly at home with Christmas. So it's going to be an uphill battle um, for um, middle class to establish um, the church services that recognize Christmas. And Smith also alludes to the second obstacle, and that is the um, folk Christmas, the folk celebration of Christmas. Um, in America for a long time, um, because there was not a religious tradition, there um, still remained a strong folk tradition of Christmas. And just as um, an example of that, we can look at Philadelphia during the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, Christmas celebrations in the city looked a little bit like a combination of Halloween and New Year's. Uh, these celebrations were mostly made up of young white males, sometimes out of work this time of year, and they were blowing off steam. They dressed in masks, they masked themselves as African Americans, as women, as African American women. Um, there was a tradition of giving away free drinks at grog shops. 
And so Christmas was kind of a big party and very public, very out in the open. And the middle class didn't like that. Um, the type of music you would have heard, say, during this street celebration um, in Philadelphia was something called a Califumpian band. And I'm going to play a little bit of a track. Uh, just This is a simulation of what a Califumpian band would have sounded like in Philadelphia. A player turned itself off. I think 10 seconds of that is enough. <laughs> uh, it was a noise. And basically these bands, these Calathumbian bands, would be, say, a handful of maskers who um, picked up any rude instrument they could make a noise on, and that's exactly what they did. And it's very disruptive. I've got a quote here from a Quaker diary um, from that um, time period from Elizabeth Drinker. Last night, or rather this morning, I heard the kettle drum for a long time. It is a disagreeable noise in my ears. It was after one o'clock and at two, I sat up and took a pinch of snuff, <laughs> which I do not do. But when I feel so unwell and uncomfortable, I had slept none, nor for some length after that time. So the folk celebration was so obnoxious it was driving Quaker women to take snuff during this time period. <laughs> so we have a long battle um, and, um, that would take place as the middle class tried to establish um, Christmas. Christmas songs and Christmas carols would be very much a part of that change, a part of changing traditions to something that we would recognize um, today. And so we're going to look at a number of people that wrote Christmas songs and we're going to learn a little more about their lives. This is James Lord Pierpont who wrote um, Jingle Bells in 1857. And let's start by listening to a little bit of a um, recording of Jingle Bells. This is, uh, these recordings, um, with one exception, which I'll tell you, are from the Gilded Age. So these um, recordings go quite a ways back. There's a story told about um, James Lord Pierpont, and I use story in quotations, uh, that around 1850, he was living in Medford, Massachusetts. He would have been about 18 at the time. And he'd been given an assignment to write a um, song for church. His father was a minister. And he uh, wasn't sure what he wanted to do, and so one day he it's winter in Bedford, and he walks outside. There's snow on the ground, and as he is walking along, he sees another number of young men who have hitched sleighs to horses, and they are having races. And this gives him an idea. And so he decides to go down to uh, Mrs. Waterman's boarding house. Mrs. Waterman has the only uh, piano in town. He has some musical ability, and he sits down and starts writing a song. When he's finished, she says, that's a merry jingle you have there. This is one of the stories that are fun to tell, but very hard to verify. This story um, first starts circulating, say, in the 1940s in a newspaper. And um, that's nearly 100 years after the fact, told by a distant relative of Mrs. Waterman. And we find with many of our um, Christmas songs that stories, these sort of folk stories, grow up around them. What we do know about um, Pierpont 
is that he was born in 1822. His father was John Pierpont. He would later be the uncle to J.P. Morgan. Um, he was a free spirit, or more negatively, some saw him as a typical preacher's son. He, um, 10 years old, was sent to boarding school, and at 14, he ran away, joined the Navy. He came back home and got married, had a couple of children, and by 1849, he was, I guess, tired of being at home, so he decided to go to California for the gold rush. He was going to start a business and make money. He left his family with his parents and went to California, and everything he had was stored in a warehouse. The warehouse burned down. He came back home, stayed a couple more years, and his brother, John Jr., uh, was also a Unitarian minister, Unitarian abolitionist minister, and his brother had been invited to go to a church in Savannah, Georgia, and he asked James, who had the musical ability, to come with him to Georgia, and so James went, again, leaving his family behind. This is around 1853. In 1856, uh, James Lord Pierpont's wife in Medford dies, uh, she had tuberculosis, and in 1857, he remarries. He marries the daughter of the mayor of Savannah, so he's traveling in some pretty high circles in Savannah. 1857 is the same year that he writes Jingle Bells, originally published as One Horse Open Sleigh. It did not um, become a hit right away, and this is true with many of the songs that we will talk about today. It took them a while to get into circulation. Um, they are no radio, no records, and so it's just a you know, published by um, either by hymnals or by publishing sheet music, as this one was. Just a couple of pictures here. This was by um, Winslow Homer um, called Sleigh Bells and a famous one by Courier and Ives that spill out in the snow. Pierpont republishes his song in 1859 as Jingle Bells or One Horse Open Sleigh. And if you can imagine that it would have been difficult to be a Unitarian abolitionist in Georgia in 1853, um, it was an untenable position in 1859. So his brother John left went back to Massachusetts. James, who had started a new family, remained behind in Georgia. He also, in 1861, did the uh, ultimate Black Sheep Act. He joined the Confederacy. His father, still in Massachusetts, was a minister in the Union Army. When he was in the um, Army, he also continued to write music. He is, we conquer or die, and um, we are left with one um, legacy of Jingle Bells. It seems like this is a type of song that's so easy and carefree that it would have no debate or controversy around it. But people continue to debate in Georgia and in um, uh, Massachusetts where he wrote the song. The story I told at the very beginning about it being written in Medford. There's no real record of that, so it's hard to prove. And so there's two historic societies, one in Massachusetts and one in Georgia, that have that claim that he wrote the song in their state. And it seems unlikely to be settled anytime soon. <laughs> Of all the people we'll look at today and talk about, Longfellow is probably um, the one, at least in the popular American imagination, that would still be remembered for something besides the fact that he wrote a Christmas song or a carol. Um, he was born in 1807, making him about 15 years older than Pierpont. And by the beginning of the Civil War, um, too old probably to fight, and I think some of the records of his life anyway indicate that he was a pacifist, though very much also an abolitionist. Um, 
Longfellow wrote Christmas Bells, which would later be turned into I Heard the Bells on Christmas Eve. And so let's hear, um, we do not have a track for that, but we are going to listen to a reading of the poem. Christmas Songs by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, read for LibriVox.org, since 2006 by Claire Boucher. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men, till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice that shine, a chant sublime, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black, cursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound, the carols drowned, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of the continent, and made forlorn the household's form, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. End of poem. Um, Longfellow had, um, as I said, he was in his early 50s by the beginning of the Civil War, and he was nationally known. The Song of Hiawatha in the 1850s would have been very famous, so he was known as a teacher and a national poet. Uh, the years of the war, though, Civil War, were um, years of personal tragedy for him. His wife, um, Fanny Longfellow, died in 1861. Um, he had pursued her for seven years before she agreed to marry him in 1850, I mean 1843, and they would have six children. And by all accounts, they, they were a very happy family. But it was in the summer, they were living in Cambridge of um, summer of 1861, she was trimming curls off of one of the children's hair and was going to preserve those in sealing wax. And apparently a few um, drops of the wax or a match fell on her dress and she just was engulfed in flames. Longfellow had been taking a nap and when he got up he tried to put the fire out but the rug he had to put the fire out was too small and so he finally had to put himself on top of her to finally get the flame out. So he got it out but she had been very badly burned and um, she would be in and out of consciousness over the night. And then the next morning at around 10 o'clock, she asked for a cup of coffee and then she died. And so this would of course color um, his feelings around Christmas for, for probably the rest of his life, but you can imagine over the next several years, it would have been very traumatic. Um, his personal feeling would have been even, increased even more um, toward um, tragedy when in 1863 his son decided to join the Union Army and he did this without telling his father he ran away and joined the army and in November of 1863 he was badly injured in battle. Longfellow and his family received word from the army that Charles had been um, shot or, or injured in the face and that it was a very um, bad wound and so Longfellow had to go with another son and travel to find Charles. They were going behind battle lines and, and trying to you know, find him, and they finally did. And he had been badly injured, but he was shot in the back, not in the face, and they were able to take him home. This uh, background gives you, though, I think some type of, of feeling of his frame of mind when he wrote a poem called Christmas Bells and Christmas of 1863. One of the things I think about many of our Christmas songs and carols is that we become incredibly used to them. We've heard them so often. This is true of national anthems. We hear them so often, we often let the words sort of just fade into the background. We lose their power. I think for this song, 
Uh, it is very much the dark night of one man's soul. He's trying to believe that everything will be all right, but he doesn't know. Uh, he believes in the abolitionist cause, but there is a terrible price to pay for um, this war. At this point, 1863, nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows how the war is going to end. Nobody knows whether Lincoln will be reelected. And so there is um, a great deal still unknown. Now, I wanted to mention one last thing. It's only in 1872 when an English composer named John Baptist Calkin writes music for this, uh, for Christmas bells. And at this point, they do something that's kind of, I think, really interesting. They take two of his stanzas out of the song. Um, I'm just going to read the first one, if I can see it here. Then from each black, a cursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Uh, as, as we say from the south, those are fighting words. He is very much blaming the south for the war, and these are not reconciling words, and I think only by taking these um, verses out were we able to get a song, a song that I think um, is ultimately reconciling. We want to look next at um, a, two or three men who wrote um, some of our favorite carols um, during, mostly in the later half of the 19th century. In fact, we sort of have a carol renaissance going on at this time. Uh, at the same time, middle class in America are getting interested in um, Christmas in general. In England, there is a movement to preserve carols. Um, their carol activity in general had fallen out of um, practice in Europe, and it was also true in America following the Reformation. And so a lot of people started collecting these carols, and the result was that a lot of people were able to start including these carols in services but it also inspired people to start writing um, new songs. Oh, here's a picture of um, Lincoln. Um, he's uh, welcoming the South back into the Union. This was by a cartoonist Thomas Nast in the um, Harper's Weekly. First person we'll look at is Henry or John Henry Hopkins, who wrote. Um, we Three Kings of Orient are um, first same year that uh, Pierpont wrote Jingle Bells, and we'll hear a piece of that track now. His parents had come from Dublin and from Hamburg. His father would work in a number of positions, including the law, and eventually become the second Episcopal Bishop of Vermont. This uh, Vermont connection is kind of interesting. He, um, Hopkins would spend his youth in Vermont, and later go to college in Vermont. He was a lifelong bachelor, and he'd be buried in Vermont, but he spent most of his life in New York and uh, Pennsylvania. Someone, though, would decide at some point that because he had written We Three Kings, he should be the Father Christmas of Vermont. That's a, not, not sure how he would have felt about that. He um, went to the University of Vermont, took him a while to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. In the early 1840s, 1842 to 44, he was um, in Savannah, 10 years before um, Pierpont's and he was teaching um, uh, Bishop Elliott's children, um, tutoring them for a couple of years. He came back to New York and worked as a reporter in New York City and thought he would go into the law, but he didn't. He ended up going back to seminary and ended up um, working with the, the um, Episcopal Church for the rest of his life. In 1853, he founded a um, 
a church journal. It was called the Church Journal. Um, he wrote a number of pamphlets. And in 1855, he became the first person the seminary hired as a music director. And it is during his years as a music director at the seminary, it's a general theological school, uh, that he wrote We Three Kings of Orient R. Some people um, believe that he wrote it for a ceremony at the seminary, but the more common story is that um, Uncle Henry wrote it for his nieces and nephews um, back in Vermont to present as a Christmas present. And it was actually presented as um, dramatically. You would have three male voices, and the first verse they would sing together, and then the next three verses all focused on one of the gifts of the king. And so um, then there would be three solo parts at that point. I've got a quote here from um, Hopkins. He wrote, the only way to test a hymn is not merely to read it silently or even aloud, but to sing it over and over again to its own tune. The reason we have so much unsatisfactory material thrust upon the church is that, for the most part, the writers of the words have known little about music and the writers of music have little taste or power in the poetic field. I lost my, okay. Therefore, there was no felt organic connection between the two. Let me move on to um, Sears, um, who wrote, Dr. Edmund Sears, who wrote It Came Upon the Midnight Clear in 1849. I'm sorry, 1849. Uh, this is probably the earliest of um, the major um, carols, American carols, during this time period. Uh, Dr. Sears was a, a very quiet man. He spent most of his life at uh, Unitarian churches in um, throughout Massachusetts. He got offers to go to um, bigger churches, probably more lucrative offers, but he seems to have preferred the quieter parishes um, in the interior. He, like Popkins, also wrote a, a religious magazine, one called the Monthly Religious Magazine. And again, in 1849, he wrote the lyrics to It Came Above the Midnight Clear. Uh, this is a case where we have another story that's hard to verify, but it, it almost sounds like a setting for a, a scene um, in Hollywood. He is in his study one day. He has a fire going in the fireplace. It's winter time in Massachusetts. Um, outside, the snow is falling. And he gets inspired, and so he goes and starts writing down a poem, which someone else will later um, add music to. And that is how he wrote, it came up on a midnight clear. He sent it to his friend, Dr. Morrison. And um, Dr. Morrison um, edited another um, magazine, the Christian Register in Boston. And Dr. Morrison said, Sears' second Christmas hymn was sent to me as editor of the Christian Register, I think in December 1849. I was very much delighted with it, and before it came out in the Register, read it at Christmas celebration of Dr. Lutz Sunday School in Quincy. I always feel that however poor my Christmas sermon may be, the reading and singing of this hymn are enough to make up for all deficiencies. I'm going to tell you just a little bit, or at least just play a clip of the song by the next man named Phillips Brooks, um, who wrote A Little Town of Bethlehem in 1868.
town of Bethlehem after coming back from the um, Holy Land in 1865. And this is just some pictures of the Holy Land um, early time period, the service, Christmas Eve service. He attended a Christmas Eve service. I think the service lasted like five hours, uh, but very much for him a renewal of faith. And he felt like he was re able to recapture um, the feeling of what it was like to be in the Holy Land on Christmas Eve by writing this song. All these songs that we have talked about today were written between 1849 and 1872. And one question I'd like to address as we close is at what point did church services and caroling become norm for America in relation to Christmas? When would we have started hearing carols in church? I've got a quote here from Tanya Golovich, and um, she wrote, Between the years of 1830 and 1870, Christmas slowly crept into Sunday school curriculums. Um, Sunday schools were easier to kind of um, get Christmas started, and often lay people worked in Sunday schools, and so there were fewer restrictions. And probably because they were working with children, maybe people did not worry as much about um, the changing of tradition. Her quote continues, by the end of the century, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, and Congregationalist were offering Christmas services on the Sunday nearest Christmas. It is interesting if you look at New York City newspapers from the time period, by the 1890s, they have such rich music programs going in churches, it almost looks as though they are competing to see who can have the best music program. The other thing that would change around this time period in the 1890s is caroling. One supposes that um, Americans always um, caroled in some um, fashion, but it was only in the late 1890s that it really became popular, and by the teens you actually had an um, organization called the National Bureau for the Advancement of Music that started promoting caroling. And by the 20s, you have hundreds, perhaps thousands, of community sending out carolers on Christmas Eve wearing red hats, um, fanning out into the community. By the 1920s, the movement to establish a new domestic Christmas in churches and within communities uh, had come full circle. In the 1820s, the middle class very much wanted a Christmas celebration within the church, one that included carols and songs, and by the end of the 19th century, they had that. They also wanted to curb the folk celebration of Christmas, and by the teens and 20s, they had um, included many um, Christmas tree celebrations, um, community Christmas tree celebrations, and along with uh, many carolers. And so they totally changed the uh, public space for Christmas. When we think about our uh, Christmas traditions, again, we often accept that they've always been here. But I think we need to remember, and we owe thanks to people that wrote many of these songs, like Pierpont, Hopkins, and Brooks, and for very much working to shape the celebration that we have today. Thank you very much. Now, any questions? I'd be glad to take questions from anybody. Question back here. Okay. Go ahead. Did you have a favorite Gilded Age Christmas song and favorite modern Christmas carol? My favorite. But repeat it in the microphone so okay. I like it here. Uh, gentleman asked what was my favorite um, Gilded Age Christmas song and what is my um, favorite modern Christmas song. Um, I think probably A Little Town of Bethlehem. These songs, one thing I love about these songs, these old carols, is that the, they're very broad. And you never look back at these songs and think, you know, a Unitarian carol or an Episcopal carol. They are carols, I think, that go for a simpler language that we all can relate to. And I think A Little Town of Bethlehem really carries that kind of peace and harmony with it. 
Uh, for more modern songs, I think my favorite is uh, Pretty Paper, which is a Willie Nelson song that Roy Orbison had a hit with back in uh, 1963. question here? Um, what, well, two things actually. The first thing is uh, about the German influence on uh, Christmas and the carols. And the other thing is a Vermonter. <laughs> we uh, prefer Vermont. <laughs> As Calvin Coolidge would say, Vermont, the state I love. <laughs> <laughs> of the German influence would have been important through Lutherans. Um, uh, people did celebrate Christmas earlier in America, but it was just a minority that Lutherans would have been one of the groups that um, celebrated Christmas. Lutherans, for, for a long time, people thought that Away in the Manger was written by Martin Luther, which it, it wasn't. Um, and so after a lot of research, a research uh, librarian named Richard Hill in 1945, he did the research and he couldn't identify who wrote it, but he said it should be so Lutherans in Pennsylvania probably wrote Away in the Manger. And so through that hymn and very much through the fact that the Lutherans did continue to celebrate Christmas, that would filter into more conservative Methodist Presbyterians and others later on. Yes. Okay, and make sure I have your uh, question right. You're asking how the carols were influential and how things were, Christmas was changing in England? Yes. Uh, actually, this, it would be very similar. By the time, it's as far as having like a carol service, I think it's like in the 1870s and maybe one of the first ones just the carol service is done in England. And very much it's England that's jump-starting the carol movement by collecting all of these old songs that go back to the 14th and 15th century. So England, middle class, they're very much looking to, um, you know, change their traditions just like we were here. Anybody else? Yes. You had mentioned that the Episcopalians, Lutherans, and Catholics were celebrating Christmas in the earlier part of the century. Were carols a component of that celebration, or was that an evolution over time? Um, yes, that was, but I don't know how extensive it was. Um, I understand, like, another group that celebrated uh, Christmas, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, the Moravians um, had a very rich tradition of Christmas music of Episcopals. You would have always heard the Christmas bells. Um, and so there would have been some music circulating, but a lot of the carols are carols as we think of them being maybe a little more down to earth as opposed to say like Handel's Messiah. Um, that would come along, I think, in a little later period of time. I think that'll do it. Thank you, Rob. Um, I learned, I didn't know that uh, J.P. Morgan's cousin wrote A Christmas Carol. That's good to know. It's a small world, right? All right. I hope all of you will join us. Thank you for attending today, by the way, and thank you for those who came online.